Buenos días a todos y bienvenidos. Good morning and welcome to our panel on political risk. My name is Andres Martins. I'm head of uh, correspondence for Bloomberg News. We have a very interesting panel. I want to make a very brief introduction and then I will introduce everybody. Over the past weeks in the region, we have seen a very interesting uh, things happening in Brazil with the street uh, uh, demonstration changes uh, in the LEM uh, changes in Peru. We have seen the Odebrecht impact in Colombia, in, in others in Paraguay. We've had the Congress, and the list is long. In Venezuela, who, with the changes introduced by Maduro. And the list, as I said, is long, but all of this has to be taken into account as a region with the panorama that we have now. How do we analyze these risks for the companies, the populations? And we have very interesting panel members that will assist us in helping, in understanding better what has happened over the past three years in the region why some of the signals that sh could should have helped us uh, to understand these risks have been lost. Uh, I don't think we understood them properly and what the future brings about, how to understand that. I have Jose Augusto, who is head of uh, policy of the Brazilian Federation, left of him, Alejandro Guerrero, uh, CEO and corporate country manager of March Argentina, and Mauricio La Sala, deputy director of business and human rights resource center in the United Kingdom. To begin, I would like to talk with Alex uh, that has very interesting perspectives on what's, what has happened over the past uh, two or three years in the region regarding politics and the risks involved when government is, should have been listening. They focused uh, very much on the headlines. How do you see communication between governments, uh, populations? Uh, thank you. Good morning. And thank you for being here. I think that is important to analyze in the air, in the age of meta information, because sometimes we have too much information. When you take on board the political risk, one of the main problems is to understand how governments interpret information, how they read, because they don't know, read exactly what their voters are deciding or asking. And I think these uh, uh, readings are a little bit uh, manipulated by headlines. If we take a look at the important political events, let's start about the two most serious cases. In the two countries where the water political risk is, we've had the biggest changes with Trump or Brexit that have changed the political risk map from the standpoint of those that were assessing us. And this has been a problem of reading, reading the information, the Democrat part, Democratic Party, uh, or in, the U, in England, when they read the referendum, they didn't read properly. Because what everybody knew in the case that Trump couldn't win and that Brexit would not pass, it happened. So, and this is not something that is only for them. It happens to us in Argentina and in other places. Evo Morales prepared a referendum that went bad. Here in Argentina, there was also a reading problem um, for last Saturday where the government, first of all, didn't want they didn't want to support, but it was fearful that the popular movement for defense of the democracy could go badly, and they didn't want to be hooked to that. And we saw that elsewhere there have been referendums, and everybody who suggested something in a referendum did it poorly. In, the, in Switzerland, there was a referendum to eliminate the taxes, and they said, no, we want to pay taxes. So these problems with information is too much information, too recent, too day-to-day, -to -day, and sometimes the reading is poor. 
So when we talk about the political risk, this is of the essence because the foreign investor, what they're looking for is for governments to interpret well what their political risk rules are. In other words, what are the factors that count? And second, that they have a proper reading so as to make the proper decisions. That is essential. One of the biggest problems is a reading problem on how to read the meta information. You have all too much information and too recent. Jose Augusto, you have been uh, working for 30 years in your confederation about the reading with the polls. And in Brazil, obviously, very difficult times have gone over the past two or three years regarding political risks and so on. How did you manage to improve that as representative? Well, you have 250,000, 350,000 companies you represent. What did you do to better understand the risks in order to avoid, at least to some extent, what happened in the past in Brazil? Good morning. I believe that the Clinton's advisor for communication, when uh, I said it's the economy stupid, I think today in Brazil would say it's the politics stupid. That is the main issue. To some extent, our organization did uh, population surveys for the past uh, 30 years, trying to understand what are the most important facts for population how the population assesses certain country transformation processes that we have, and so on. We also work with Congress, trying to assess how members of parliament think. I think one of the important changes is the network, social networks. Before, we used to do only surveys with the population, whereas now we have started to analyze the social networks of the MPs. We try to understand through the networks with whom these MPs are dialoguing or networking inside the Congress and what are the signals that the population is transmitting regarding these social network communication factors. And we understand that these are complementary products. You cannot analyze the risk only by looking at the social networks. There is a very big bias that must be dealt with. Likewise, it is impossible only with the surveys on the population to have a proper image. That's why we believe that we believe we have to perfect these two tools. Right now, we are trying to understand what is the uh, mood that tips the population's point of view uh, we try to perfect the types of survey we carry out with population. I uh, will come back to the tipping point, but I want to go to Mauricio. Mauricio, uh, Alex and Jose have mentioned from a political standpoint what can be done, but there is a uh, there is a gap and there is a very huge communication uh, problem. How can you close this gap and what are you doing to understand why these problems uh, come up like Ecuador, Brazil, Peru and so on? Thank you, Andres. First of all, I have to say that it is not ideal to be in a men-only panel, and I know the WEF is working to improve that. We have seen an exponential growth rate in the national and popular movements, not only in the South, but also in the North, and many have come to power. How does this come about? Well, there are many factors. 
Uh, inequalities. Yesterday, the ECLAC uh, General Secretary talked about Gini coefficients that are very high for Latin America. Latin America is still the most unequal continent in the world. Marginalization, the fact that these movements uh, exploit fears and xenophobia in order to grow. Over the coming two years, we will have 18 elections in Latin America. And of course, the political risks are our day-to-day -day bread. At the same time, the space where the civil society is working has become narrower and narrower. And I'm talking about the wide civil society, not only the NGOs, but the journalists, academia, the UN agencies, and so on and so forth. How has this space become narrow? Well, laws have been enacted to restrict civil society, restricting external funding, penalization, or we use a judicial system to penalize people who are criticizing certain public policies or certain ideas of the private sector. There are regulations and bureaucracy. Last year, just to give you one example, Ecuador tried to take a license to an environmental NGO after it created the plan for extracting or mining of the government. And the worst of these examples are the attacks against those who are defending human rights, community leaders, indigenous populations, and so on. We launched two months ago a database where we documented incidents of attacking against people defending human rights of companies and um, and and we documented 460 incidents in two years 2015 and 16 and the six most dangerous countries are all in Latin based in Latin America Mexico Guatemala Honduras Colombia Peru and Brazil so the situation is really concerning. And how does this affect the companies? And what can companies do? Well, I'll, I'll talk about three issues. One, some companies that do not have any scruples are accomplices of these attacks. This must stop. Some companies have used the judiciary system lightly to fight against their those that criticize them, and they are being exposed to big risk like uh, lawsuits, but they're also exchanging wins in the short run with losses in the long term. Second, there is a business case that, uh, that goes like this. Companies and civil society are in the same boat and their interests are the same. People don't think that, but they are not enemies and people should know that. Uh, from civil society perspective, there's also a trend to see companies as enemies, but they're not. Why? Well, because both uh, so civil society and companies are interested in respecting the li right of law, in, in rules of the game being clear, in having rights to, of speech, uh, association rights, the free movement of ec capital, and so on and so forth. Both. This is interesting for everybody. A high uh, political and social volatility is bad. A uh, corrupt uh, judicial system is bad. Judiciary system is bad. The critical thoughts are good and should be stimulated for both. Besides, the company, the companies that are seen as accomplices, uh, are facing boycotts and protests and not having social licenses, very expensive lawsuits, very expensive insurance policies, and so forth. So, the third item is that there are already some companies that have understood this and that have publicly said they are in favor of civil society, the rule of law, uh, the NGOs, and so And we see that coming every day a little more. Yesterday, for example, we saw that Twitter has uh, sued the government of the U.S. because it asked 
to close some uh, uh, accounts that are criticizing uh, Donald Trump's. Not only Twitter uh, refused, it also um, sued the state in defending the uh, uh, right of speech. There are other studies, uh, like Harvard, that says that the activism is very good for companies. It saw the case of Tim Cook, of CEO of Apple, when it went against, fought against a law against gays and lesbians, how this took the people to buy more Apple products instead of less. Same thing when talk about fighting against climate change. This had a, an economic profit for the company. So uh, m every time there are more studies that show that when you take a political stand that is modern, also has a, an impact on economic business for the company. Now, something very interesting that you mentioned, and I believe uh, that since the beginning of the forum yesterday, uh, has been uh, mentioned many times, are the 18 elections that you have in the coming years. Either you have changes or the same governments will remain. I would ask you very fast to start and move then to questions about from, from our participants. With these elections that are coming, what is the largest risk, Jose Augusto, in Brazil for you? I don't know if you have legislative uh, legis uh, or you have uh, the, the Mr. Termes, uh, term that is about to end. What's the biggest risk? I think that uh, currently we have associated risks to lawsuits uh, by courts, etc. And this will have an effect. And the elections in 2018, I think that the risk is that if we don't introduce changes with political reform, we will have a very big splitting or fragmentation. Uh, tens of candidates uh, for a presidency, and this, of course, uh, increases the risk of uh, somebody being very populist, not only because the change is not only a left leftist uh, populism, but also right-wing uh, populism outside the mainstream. This is something like what's happening in Argentina, right? Yes, we have legislative, upcoming legislative elections in October. What's the biggest risk for Argentina? I think the October elections are not that critical. Well, first, because there won't be substantial changes in the composition of Congress. Success or failure will be a movement in terms of a small number of Congress people to one side or the other. I think the biggest risk the government faces in connection with political risk is not being able to convey messages and signals so foreign investors feel confident to bring their money to the country. The political risk is mostly linked to the financial. This government is in desperate need of uh, capitals coming in. For that, we need to offer legal certainty, confidence that the investors' assets won't be confiscated, that in the long term, investors will be able to transfer or withdraw their capital back to their countries of origin. And we should work, I think, on a prior risk management to work on regulation and on the concepts to offer certainty and confidence to foreign and local investors. Local investors also. We've just uh, had a huge tax amnesty. For many years, we didn't have any legal certainty. And that money that's been declared by locals uh, will be and needs to be invested. So it's not so much elections, but doing what they have to do, because these elections are not critical. Mauricio, of the 16 upcoming elections, which is the one that worries you the most? Which is the one you'll focus on and pay attention to because you said a few things about laws that are being changed and how the voice of certain groups of activists, journalists is being stifled. So which do you think is the most important upcoming election which we should see as a standard for the region? 
It's an excellent question. I think that the biggest risk in general of all these elections is that they may result in governments that do not pay attention or attach importance to social dialogue. In our viewpoint, social dialogue is of the essence to reduce social conflicts, which is a risk for companies, for businesses, and for civil society to the same extent. As we've seen, globalization today has left a significant portion of the population out, people that do not benefit and do not feel are benefiting from globalization, and this sector of the population will not remain silent, and of course not in Latin America. The important thing is to make sure that the upcoming governments pay attention to a greater social dialogue or inclusiveness, which is the most risky election. It's difficult for me to say. As a Colombian, obviously, I feel that it's the 2018 election that will be crucial because, of the, because the peace process is still evolving in Colombia. And in that regard, it will be very important. But all elections are somehow important in one way or another. Let me take this opportunity to take questions from the audience. Please, please, you have to wait. Other, we can't hear them from the booth if they don't use the microphone. I'm Guido Gazzori. I'm the correspondent of two newspapers from Italy, Il Fatto Quotidiano, which is an independent Italian newspaper, and El Subsidiario, which is um, another Italian newspaper. I have two questions, if I may. First, in November, in the Vatican, there was a meeting with the participation of Steve Queen, the British scientist, who said, if governments, if governments don't leave their arrogance aside, they'd be opening the door to parties that you were just referring to. So what do you think about this arrogance? And uh, for Dr. Guerrero, to me, the upcoming elections in Argentina are very important because Argentina at this point is, in theory, with a big uh, Formula One, great Formula One pilot uh, that uh, has to drive a Fiat 600. Because since they do not have majority in Congress, they find uh, serious obstacles to implement their policies. So how can investments come to Argentina when the country continues to use a very typical Argentine expression when we are still back in 1945 with corporatist uh, policies and uh, we've seen this yesterday with the strike and that also involves a uh, human rights organization. Everything is corporatist here. It's unprecedented. Regarding the first question, I fully agree with what the British scientists said, that if governments uh, do not stop being so arrogant, the populists will take over. So that's why I talked about interpretation of information and what people see and interpret. Now, first, I do not think that the elections will be bad for the government. But what I'm saying is that these upcoming elections in Argentina are not critical. First. I say this because I'm not a fan of having absolute majority in Congress, so it then becomes a notary's office for the government only. I very much support discussion, debate, and criticism, positive criticism. We do need, yes, to unify criteria at the national level so that all parties said five fundamental points that cannot be changed. But I don't want any particular party to have an everlasting majority in Congress to do what they want to do, whatever they want to do. I don't want that, because that's when they cease to understand, and this has to do with arrogance. They cease to understand that they are here in government in power for a time, for a while. 
and I'm not referring to President Macron in this particular, but uh, all politicians or rulers feel they are like messiahs and that they are right and the rest are wrong. And since they have a Congress that doesn't argue with them, they, their arrogance grows. So I want a diverse Congress. I want, when I say the upcoming elections are not important, I mean they are not critical because uh, there won't be a significant change in Congress composition. And I prefer to have a consensus of ideas rather than a large number of followers just signing and accepting whatever the executive says. Another question? Can you hear me? I think there are more problems in countries in terms of political risk when the population does not have the feeling that there is transparency in government. For example, if I'm a poor person and I have the feeling that there is a conversation going on behind a closed door that I cannot hear, and I'm expecting a government support, I will get angry and I will become part of the demonstrations in the street. Question for the panel, do you believe that the level of transparency is improving in some countries in Latin America, or do we still have a lot to do in that regard? Let me ask Jose in particular about Brazil and Mauricio. Jose, I think that transparency in Brazil has grown and uh, the force of uh, civil society and uh, legal institutions have shown recently the importance of an articulated uh, civil society, which was responsible for many of the transformation and also the role of the judiciary. So I think that the system, the political system, is not prepared and does need a very significant reform. What you're saying is very interesting because yesterday in another panel much was discussed about power, legal power that has played a significant role and that has pushed uh, politics in Brazil. But today the legal power might become even greater than the political power. So that could cause problems too. So it's something that we could think about. It's like a pendulum. We have, we will have to go back. I fully agree with what the gentleman just said. Transparency is absolutely crucial key because it comes hand in hand with access to information. And access to information is key, essential, so that citizens can make, hold politicians accountable. And transparency is good for businesses as well as for civil society. Let me give you an example companies that publish in a transparent manner what they pay by way of royalties and taxes to local, regional, and national governments. We used to think that it was bad for competitiveness, but today leading companies understand that it's not bad. They are doing so voluntarily. And the mere fact of publishing what they pay makes local and national authorities become much more accountable before they are citizens, uh, as opposed to they are not having that information. Transparency is of the essence. I think we have time for one further question. The industry of Brazil. So the, uh, I have one question. That uh, in case of the Brexit, so there was a long uh, date. So it's not correct. For example, the, so the British paid a lot of money to the EU. And in case of the United States, uh, so the President Trump said that a uh, lot of jobs were lost due to the, the globalization. They, they had all the wrong data. Why is it so the expert who has a profound uh, analysis and knowledge, they didn't uh, explain it more loudly in that case? Eh, creo que Alex, eh, y esto lo vamos a tener que hacer rapidito, rapidito, pero creo que mencionaste antes la idea de que hay tanta... I think you 
said that there was a lot of information and much focus on headlines. How do we improve that? How do we improve dissemination and interpretation of information? Well, that's something that's uh, way beyond my capacity to do. Really, the problem of meta-information is misinformation. That is how this information moves, where there is a model of very strong misinformation and where the people, the populations are subject to fluctuating information, and they believe in institutions and in the sources of that information. And populism profits from that, builds on that. Populism uses misinformation, the absolute denial of concrete data, or inventing information brutally, where in that wealth of information, people remain trapped without knowing who to believe in, and they end up believing in those uh, those that speak in their most basic language. So there should be more data checks, fact checks of information to expose misinformation. I think that the most important thing is to expose false data. So it's unquestionable. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I think we could talk for one more hour, but the most important points we've referred to are transparency, which is key at the business level, at the level of activists, journalists. We've also talked about how important it is for governments to know what the population says, what the population demands. Population needs to have channels available to communicate messages, and we have to wait this year, next year, to see what happens with the 16 upcoming elections. There's great uh, dissatisfaction in the region, so there could be many changes to the right, to the left, and we have to be attentive to that. Thank you, panel members, and thank you for your time. <laughs>